we would like to thank and acknowledge our sponsors. BC3 Dreams provides high-end observatory automation and web-based multi-user remote imaging. The AAVSO Net Observatories use DC3 Dreams ACP Expert for the Bright Star Monitors and other programs. The AAVSO Photometric All Sky Survey Project, also known as APAS, has used ACP Expert's AI scheduler to automatically acquire over 500,000 star fields, hands off, at a rate of 1,000 square degrees per night. This has resulted in photometry for over 128 million objects in about 99% of the sky. The Boyce Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the Journal of the AAVSO. Please check out their webpage to learn more about their work. All right, now I have one more quick special announcement to make here. Uh, that I think would be quite relevant to our observers here in the AAVSO. Let me go ahead and make a screen share. Um, just a few hours ago, there was a, a bright nova that was discovered in Hercules. It was last reported around magnitude 6.5 and is probably still on the rise. So if that's your kind of thing, get out there, observe this new star, star in the sky, and submit your data to the AAVSO's databases. I'm going to put some links in the chat if you would like some more information. All right, now, without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, our speaker for today is Dr. Dan Milosavljevic, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Purdue University. He's held research positions at Harvard and the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, where he studied some of the highest energy events in the cosmos. His research focuses on using time domain surveys to study what kinds of stars explode in supernovae, how they explode, and how these massive explosions impact their environments. Today, Dr. Milosavljevic is here to share some of his insider knowledge about supernovae and teach us all about the supernova early warning system, also known as SNOOS. Joining him later on will be two of his collaborators from the SNOOS team, Dr. Barry Poynton and Dr. Alec Habig. Dr. Poynton and Dr. Habig will be helping out by providing their expert input in a panel Q&A at the end of this presentation. All right, now, without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Dr. Milosavljevic. Welcome. Okay, Lauren, thank you very much for the introduction and thank the AVSO for the opportunity to speak to everyone. I don't see anyone, but I know that you're out there and I appreciate uh, taking the time uh, to listen to me on behalf of the SNOOS team to, to speak. Uh, the topic of observing the next galactic supernova is incredibly rich, and I'm going to try not to rush through it, at least highlight some aspects of it that I think are, are, are most important and most relevant for the AAVSO uh, community. Now, with that said, I will share my screen and look at my cluttered desktop. There we go. So as I said, yes, I'm, I'm speaking here on behalf of the Supernova Early Warning System uh, collaboration. This is an international um, group made of uh, scientists of diverse research interests because uh, supernovae are among the most complex astrophysical laboratories re requiring expertise spanning broad fields. My uh, emphasis here will be uh, the observations needed uh, to observe the next galactic super, supernova that will provide the most information, scientifically rich um, uh, data set from which we can understand the fundamental properties of a stellar explosion. So I like to start uh, these talks with, with this simple sentence. Yes, we have watched stars explode. So I'm going to show you probably among the most important recent examples. Here is a, a, a star being highlighted in the Large Magellanic Cloud. Now, for those of you who live in the Southern Hemisphere or who have visited, uh, you've potentially likely seen the, the Magellanic Clouds. You know, they're, they're a little bit challenging. You might need to use averted vision. I often need to, but you see these dense, sorry, these, these light fluffy regions. 
So this is in the Large Magellanic Cloud, and the arrow is pointing to this star, which is not really noticeable among other stars. You see there are brighter ones, but it means something's happening or about to, right? And indeed, in uh, February 23rd, uh, 1987, there was a supernova explosion. The first light from the supernova uh, reached here on Earth. Uh, it's very fitting that the name is 1987A, so uh, supernova classification increases uh, alphanumerically. So it starts A, then B, then C, and then it goes A, 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 B, etc. So this was the first, but it was also discovered, co-discovered uh, by a Canadian, Ian Shelton. So it's 1987A. Uh, I'm a Canadian, so I'm allowed to use that joke. Uh, I use it all the time, even though I get groans for it all the time. So here, this progenitor star exploded, producing this uh, tremendous energy output. And then we returned to that site uh, years later using the razor sharp vision of the Hubble Space Telescope. And the star is gone. And in its place is a debris field. Now I could spend a whole uh, session explaining everything that's going on here. This is not associated with the supernova. This is mass loss by the progenitor system. This also is not result of the explosion. This was shed by the progenitor star system. And there's actually very interesting questions to ask about, well, why this ring here and these rings there? What was going on with the star system, which we think was likely a, a binary system beforehand? The actual stellar debris is this, and over time we've watched it expand. Okay? It's a tremendous explosion, it starts at this explosion point of the star and it expands. So first of all, some, some motivation. Why should we care? Why is this an important process? Well, among other things, supernovae influence the energy balance, structure, and chemical makeup uh, of, of galaxies. Uh, from this stellar death, they're able to trigger new star formation. Uh, as we peer more deeply into the universe, we, we come into increasing uh, dust obscuration, and supernovae are significant sources of dust, so that's important to know. Uh, they produce a variety of exotic objects that many people like to talk about, including neutron stars, black holes, and some gamma ray bursts. They produced copious neutrinos, these subatomic particles that don't like to interact with, with regular matter. This is gonna be a key point we're gonna discuss um, in this talk. Uh, they are also, the supernova explosions are progenitors of gravitational wave systems. So the neutrinos, sorry, the neutron stars that I mentioned uh, and the black holes, uh, when they merge, they can produce strong gravitational waves. And the supernova process itself produces gravitational waves. Okay. And probably most important for us, they manufacture the heavy elements that make life possible. So I've always said that I think as citizens of the universe, it's terribly important to understand this fundamental process. You know, the iron in our blood uh, makes it red, calcium in our bones, the oxygen we breathe, <sighs> Love that oxygen, all thanks to supernova explosions. There are many questions one can ask about supernovae. The ones that I will highlight are, what are the types of stars that explode? Uh, theoretically, we are motivated to believe that red supergiants are the kind of lone progenitors of supernovae. But in fact, supernova 1987A demonstrated that blue supergiants can be progenitors of supernovae, right? Because we had pre-explosion imaging that demonstrated as a blue supergiant. Now we found that also yellow supergiants can be uh, supernova explosions as well. So it's very important to know the type of star leading up to the core collapse. The other is the physics underlying the explosion process. How do stars explode, right? We have a car cartoon notion you know that we show in textbooks that i'm going to review but there's a lot of details that are missing and not everything adds up talking about progenitor systems so uh this is the standard kind of textbook or this one grabbed from an, a nasa uh website 
thankfully, in our own uh, solar system, the sun will not collapse to a supernova explosion. It will transition into a white dwarf. But once you reach about eight to 10 solar masses, so that's eight to 10 times the, the mass of the sun, this is the, the, the transition at which uh, a core collapse can happen. And we can collapse down to a neutron star. And if the mass is large enough, often it's said around 20 solar masses, but there are a lot of caveats to that. Uh, if, if, but if the mass is large enough, the collapse will continue and you'll have um, collapse down to a singularity, the black hole. This transition, I said 20 solar masses, but there are a lot of caveats. I point to you to uh, Tuckbold, sorry, Tuck Suckabold's um, Islands of Explodability in a Sea of Imposters. He's written a lot about this as other theorists have, where they're motivated to see that it's not necessarily a mass range. There are other considerations in the type of star about whether something becomes a neutron star or a black hole. Okay. But the kind of fundamental thing we understand, the mass range is you need to, to, to breach around eight solar masses to be able to collapse uh, and make a supernova explosion. Uh, this has gotten a lot of uh, notice uh, by the scientific and popular community. So I just wanted to mention again, that the LIGO detections that we've heard so much about recently, those are from merging black holes or merging neutron stars. Those systems, these progenitor stars were formed, were progenitor stars and the black holes were formed in uh, supernova explosions originally. So there's a lot of interest in understanding the evolution of a binary system that allows these collapsed objects to be formed in such a tight formation. Okay, so a little bit of what we think goes on in a, a supernova explosion. Traditional understanding is that you have this big ball of hydrogen and some helium. At the core, there's nuclear fusion going on that's fusing that hydrogen into helium. That continues for millions of years for a massive star. Uh, at some point, the core region uh, no longer has enough hydrogen to support that fusion. So it collapses a bit, uh, con condenses a little bit and begins to fuse helium from that pure previous ash. And it goes through successive stages of, helium, of, of, of uh, nuclear fusion with heavier elements, carbon, neon, et cetera, until you reach iron. Now iron is no longer exothermic. It does not release, the fusion of iron is no longer exothermic, it's endothermic. It robs the core of the radiative pressure it needs to maintain the balance between <laughs> gravity pulling it in and the pressure pushing it out. So that's this hydrostatic equilibrium being maintained throughout the star's life. So when that happens, there's the collapse. Now the collapse continues in most cases until uh, we reach a neutron degeneracy pressure. So there's these neutrons that are formed in the core collapse process and the neutrons say, hey, I'm not getting any closer to my neighbors. You, you gotta stay, keep your distance. And then the fault material above bounces off of that. And for many years, it was thought that this bounce shock was what drove the supernova explosion. But decades of simulation show that this doesn't seem to be the case the collapses just continue down into a black hole. Now that's possible, but in the case of 1987A, we know that there must be explosive scenarios. So there's something else contributing to the supernova explosion process. And it's that something else that uh, we need help in understanding. Okay. One thought is that the copious neutrinos that are produced in that core collapse process even though they normally go about their ways, you know, not easily interacting with matter, but at the intense uh, densities and temperatures of the core of the star, they may impart some of their energy to this prompt shock in helping it explode. So this is a simulation, okay? The blue is the material falling in, and this is the core region. This is being pushed around by uneven heating of neutrinos that are trying to get out. Okay, there's this sloshing back until finally there's a successful explosion. The other thought is if the core has enough rotation, okay, 
Moving particles, okay, charged particles can contribute magnetic fields and that can add the little oomph that you need to have an explosion. Now, it's thought that this is in, in more extreme cases because not many stars are believed to have the rotation at their core to power the explosion. But we think it does happen and there may be a continuum from uneven neutrino heating to uh, events driven by these magneto rotational jets. Okay, so that's the physics. That's the background that I wanted to provide, okay? The motivation for understanding supernovae and what we think the, the basic premise behind the explosion is, but the unknowns, okay? What's happening? What's the magic between that collapse and explosion? Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about observing supernovae. Okay. Now, they can and do happen uh, in our own galaxy. And when this happens, they can be observed for many months, over a year, and seen with the naked eye, even during the day. Okay. There, there is, uh, you know, records, ancient Chinese, Korean records, and elsewhere in the world documenting where these guest stars, it's like almost an uninvited guest because they came without any announcement, right? these guest stars appearing. Here I'm showing a slide, uh, an etching of uh, Tycho Brahe, or Tycho Brahe, as I'm told uh, by the Danes, uh, the, for the supernova of 1572. I wish I had a whole you know, hour to talk about the stories of, of, of Tycho Brahe, very interesting character, um, but uh, I'll, I'll save that for another time. Uh, this. Uh, recording of the supernova of 1572 was among the most important in what we call time domain astronomy because he had such sophisticated instruments. He was able to demonstrate that this wasn't just like a comet that we'd seen before, it remained stationary. Okay. So this was demonstration that the, the, the heavens were not everlasting and permanent. Okay. They could change. And this is actually a radical departure from what they'd assume beforehand. Now, fun thing is we can actually go to that location in the sky now and see what it looks like. And this is what it is. So this is now what we call a supernova remnant, the remains of the supernova. Uh, we call it Tycho's remnant or uh, supernova 1572. You can see this almost I, popcorn. This is an x-ray image that's been overlaid with optical. That's why you can see all the stars. Okay, and this is all the supernova debris. Now, let me be clear. There are different types of supernovae. There's the type 1A supernovae associated with explosions of white dwarfs. And that's where material either through another companion white dwarf or some other uh, um, main sequence star or evolved star is pooled material onto it enough for it to explode. This is not the purpose of this talk, though we can ask questions about it afterwards. My discussion is about core collapse, but I wanted to give an example of galactic supernovae. It just happens that all the darn galactic supernovae happen to be type 1a. <laughs> okay, so here's an example of 1572, and there's this very kind of uh, rich uh, description from uh, Tycho Brahe, and he, he basically says it was either the greatest thing that ever occurred or the second greatest thing that ever occurred. Um, in mankind's history. Here is another um, galactic supernova that has no credible ob uh, observations of when it went off. That's why there's a question mark here. Supernova 1680 question mark. Now we can estimate the age by following the expansion of the ejecta. And this is a, an object I'm totally obsessed over. I mean, can I show? I mean, there it is there. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm very happy that uh, the obsessions played out because I've been approved for cycle one observations with the James Webb Space Telescope uh, for a medium-sized program on Cassiopeia, which is very exciting. Anyhow, so this was a, a galactic supernova with no credible uh, uh, sighting, but this is what it looks like today. And just as a teaser trailer for my uh, other research, what I... What I do in my other time is doing three-dimensional reconstructions of those remnant fields. 
and do a sort of bomb squad investigation. So if I know where the material has been distributed and what it's made of, kind of like a bomb squad, I can reconstruct what the explosion mechanism and what material went into the original um, explosion. Uh, the Crab Nebula. Okay, so this did have uh, a, a visual, uh, this was recorded, this was very bright, which was unusually bright because if we look at the energetics today, it seems like it was much less energetic than a typical supernova. Um, this is a Hubble Space Telescope uh, image. I was also involved recently with a three-dimensional reconstruction of this. This is not a simulation that I'm showing. This is real data. I think this is the most, this is definitely the highest resolution look at the Crab Nebula in 3D that's ever been made. If you're interested, there's a recent paper that's been uh, ma made available online. You can get a link to this animation. And uh, I just got her uh, notification that uh, Michael Merrifield, who makes these uh, 3D sculptures, uh, is going to be making one with the Crab Nebula using this data. And uh, I'm putting a plug in for him because uh, he's, he's in the middle of designing it, making sure it's, it's credible. But if you're interested in what you can get it there. Okay. So historically we've seen we've seen okay supernovae either directly or we know that they've occurred through the remnants they've left behind now we want to think about when the next one happens okay and you can imagine just how nutty it was for people hundreds of years ago to observe a new source in the sky right <laughs> like this guest star right this is going to cause the same kind of uh activity, interest, oh my goshness uh, today. And we want to be as prepared as possible because we have an armada of observing facilities that are sensitive to the multiple messengers of a supernova. The neutrinos that are produced, the gravitational waves that are produced, and all the electromagnetic radiation. Okay. So let me explain this plot. This is a, a, a measure of the energy output per second. And this is time relative to core bounce. So remember I talked about this collapse and then the moment it says, hey, I can't, we, this, uh, neutrons can't get any closer together. So the material bounces off. So that this time is with regard to that. And it's in log time. So each individual unit is 10 times. Think of like the, uh, the seismic uh, Richter scale. Okay. So, what do we notice here? So leading up to uh, core bounce, there isn't very much energy in electromagnetic and, 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 and uh, EM, yeah, electromagnetic and gravitational waves as to be expected. But there is a, a gradually increase in uh, the neutrino output. Okay, as we see the, these are just different flavors, what they call of neutrinos, different types. Okay? You can see here that the neutrino output is orders of magnitude stronger than the gravitational wave and the EM. Also notice that the neutrino output uh, comes sooner by uh, minutes to hours. And this depends a lot on the structure of the star, how large it is, right? But the neutrinos have a lead time from when the first electromagnetic radiation arrives at Earth. And therein lies the premise behind SNOOS, the Supernova Early Warning System, is that there is um, a number of neutrino facilities conducting experiments around the Earth. And the next galactic supernova is kind of going to light up the tanks, as it were, right? And that's going to provide a heads up that a galactic supernova has occurred and provide us some notice to get on the sky, as it were, and begin observing. Some perspective. Remember, I talked about at the beginning the 1987A supernova. Now, that was pretty distant. It wasn't officially in our own galaxy. It's a satellite galaxy, large Magellanic cloud. And neutrino facilities at the time detected approximately 20 neutrinos total. I mean, you can count them on your fingers, give them names. Okay. 
Here you can see uh, recording, this is in time, and here is plotted uh, from the various facilities, okay? Time with re respect to, yeah, T0 here. Now, there have been significant improvements in neutrino facility technology and the number of experiments that are running. So modern facilities have the potential to detect thousands of neutrinos. So all of a sudden we can have this rich data set from which to explore that core collapse process that I talked about. Okay. In fact, those messengers from the core, the neutrinos, and uh, I may get into a little bit describing how those neutrinos provide a window of time from which to search for gravitational wave signatures. But those two messengers provide really the only insight into what's happening at the core because they're streaming out from the core process. So a galactic supernova will have tremendous uh, messenger output from which we can explore those processes. So below this is a listing of the uh, approximate numbers of detected neutrinos from a core collapse assuming a distance of uh, 10 kiloparsecs. And that's a decent scale for uh, one in our own galaxy. And you can see that uh, they're assuming three different mass ranges, 11.2 solar masses, 27 and 40. Okay. So these are the various experiments. And because they're doing different types of science, okay, they aren't all geared, they aren't necessarily geared for detecting the next galactic supernovae, um, but nonetheless, they are sensitive to that event. And here's the, yeah, the, here is showing the number of events that will be detected. Uh, by the way, uh, if you ever get a chance to visit them, it can be a real fun ride. So we had a snooze meeting in Sudbury, Ontario, Canada, a couple of years ago. And because these experiments are very sensitive to background noise, they often need to be in isolated locations. In this case, two kilometers down in a mine shaft. You go down the elevator, you get suited up, uh, and, and there I was. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> Here, showing what we call light curves, okay, uh, of the neutrinos. So this is luminosity. This is a measure of you know the neutrinos coming in and their energy, and this is time, and this is just being uh, spread out into three different phases of the core collapse process. These light curves are for a massive neutrino facility in uh, Antarctica, ice cube. And you can see at time uh, bounce, uh, time with respect to, to, to bounce, there's an increasing number that can be detected. Yeah. Uh, if there are questions about the details of this, we have um, Alec Habig and Barry Poynton that can discuss more. I'm gonna focus more on the follow-up. So, uh, and speaking about Alec, so Alec was one of the originators between the, the uh, snooze system. So we're trying to make some noise now because we've been approved from the National Science Foundation to upgrade to snooze 2.0. Now the original snooze has been operational since uh, 2005, but what do you know, there hasn't been a galactic supernova yet. Our upgrade to 2.0, adds new facilities into the network and potentially is gonna allow for a better localization and characterization of, of the signal. And if I didn't say it explicitly before, the strength in snooze is that no one facility has to kind of stick out their neck and say, we think we see a supernova. Now, if something is very nearby, it'll be obvious, okay? But if there, it is more distant or if it is of a, a, a type of explosion that doesn't produce many neutrinos, the signal may not be as obvious. So by networking the facilities together with some um, one, yeah, with one, a central computer hub, uh, they're able to uh, have confidence. So it's not just one detecting some uh, excess uh, neutrino uh, counts, but they could be multiple. And all of a sudden you have much more confidence in being able to spread the news that something's going on.
Okay, so I hope I've, I've, I've set up the groundwork for what SNOOS is. So there are various neutrino experiments going around, going on in the world, and they're being networked uh, together to have a kind of a coincidence to understand if simultaneously they notice some kind of neutrino activity. Now, along with being networked, you get the ability to do timing experiments. So not unlike LIGO, which uses timing differences between the gravitational wave detectors to kind of triangulate a location, this is what SNOOSE is uh, gonna attempt to achieve. Okay, information that we'll need. So part of my role with SNOOSE is taking it from just a something's happening everybody to something's happening everybody in some location of the sky right with a little bit of information about it so for instance uh, a lot of talk has been gone into if we could discriminate between if it's a core collapse or if it's sorry if it's a successful core collapse explosion making a neutron star or a black hole because there's a lot of models that show that if it forms a black hole, you, you can have something called an unnova or a weak explosion. So it doesn't have this luminous, this light show associated with it, but it's collapsing down to a black hole. So the star actually winks out. And the observing strategy to follow one of these black hole collapses is different from a traditional supernova explosion. And I mentioned this briefly, the hope is that using timing information between the neutrino facilities will give us some localization. This is not unlike a uh, gravitational wave follow-up. So here is uh, combining information from uh, ice cube and super K. You can see that, you know, this is hundreds of square degrees, which is large, but today, follow-up campaigns for gravitational wave sources do this routinely. It's not as scary as it was 30 years ago. Now with uh, combining uh, future facilities on the horizon, we should, we, there's the potential to, you know, constrain this localization to be much tighter to several uh, square degrees as opposed to 100. I'll mention briefly, and I, I had it in the slide earlier, if the explosion is near enough. So for instance, if it's the Betelgeuse explosion that everybody talks about and wants, but I don't think ever gonna happen. <laughs> but, you know, it may. Uh, if it is a truly nearby star, this, so remember I talked about successive stages of nuclear fusion, as it goes through from carbon, oxygen, silicon, okay? But silicon burning happens in a day, right? And that actually is associated with an increased neutrino uh, production. That may be enough for the facilities to be sensitive to, to give us even more of a lead time, right? Then all of a sudden, our localization may improve, may or may not, but at least the candidate list of stars that may explode starts, you know, getting much smaller because it must be something, let's say within a kiloparsec. And that's a, you know, a region that we know fairly well. We like to think so as well. So an efficient search. So remember there's, we, Snooze tells us at the very least something's happening. Great, so now we got the sky to, to, to search. Okay? And maybe with some broad localization of hundred square degree or maybe smaller. Now, if it's one of these pre-supernova ones and or uh, to have a technique that has intensive monitoring of likely candidates with wide and shallow monitoring to account for the unexpected, right? Part of the strategy will be like in gravitational wave follow-up where they don't scan the whole sky, they look at host galaxies that will be associated with these uh, um, kilonovae. Here, our prior is the stars that we know of. So part of the follow-up will be intensely monitoring uh, the stars uh, that are nearby uh, that uh, are red supergiants or, or at least uh, supernova progenitor stars. And there's actually great work um, behind coming up with lists of supernova progenitor uh, stars. 
So uh, let me emphasize something here because in the professional community, there is this naive, this, this attitude, sorry, let me bite my tongue. There's this attitude that the next galactic supernova is gonna be so obvious, there's no need to plan a follow-up. Okay, this is false. This is terrible thinking. We do not want a free-for-all, okay? And I'm trying to emphasize that rich scientific opportunities will be lost unless there's a worldwide cooperative effort to coordinate the complex array of multi-messenger resources needed to fully characterize the next galactic supernova. And I want to emphasize that AAVSO members have a unique and critical role in this follow-up, okay? Yes, there are professional surveys with massive telescopes uh, that can do wide field, but nothing wins out on geographic diversity and strength in numbers. So it may be a night that those observatories are clouded out. What are you gonna do? It could happen anytime. It could happen right now, right? We need to be prepared. So for this once in a lifetime opportunity, there needs to be strength in numbers. And in fact, in the supernova world itself, there's been so many stories I can share, and I may share one or two here, where uh, the follow-up or the discovery has been made by an amateur. Uh, I'm gonna skip ahead here. There's some excitement with gravitational wave uh, follow-up, but I'm gonna move ahead here. And this was a slide to show what the difference between a neutron star formation versus black hole looks like. In this case, you can see at this time frame, the neutrino hits, so the, the neutrino production just suddenly stop, right? That's the black hole formation right there. So this provides an opportunity if analysis can be done quickly enough and the news spread to the observing that the black hole is formed. Okay, one thing I wanna emphasize is if we properly take advantage of snooze, a first priority is to attempt to find the progenitor star before shock breakout. Okay. So that means you may not see it happening, but if we can observe the star before the shock, uh, so that there's that core collapse, there's that prompt shock that moves through the rest of the star, there's some time frame, okay, for that to happen, right? If we can be observing the star and then catch the before and after, there's very rich information behind that that we've never been able to, to capture before. What, what was happening to the star in the hours leading up to that shock breakout? And pinpointing the exact point of shock breakout. And that's when that shock goes, you know, exits the stellar envelope, right? And, and this is associated with intense UV and X-ray output. We've never been able to make the precise timing between core collapse and shock breakout. And that shock is probing the star as it's going through. And that time, it, it provides very uh, a lot of information about the, the, the stellar interior. In the case of 87A, we know the exact time of core collapse, but we miss the shock breakout. Okay? In other cases, we've observed the shock breakout, but we didn't know when the precise timing of core collapse was. So I'll just move ahead. Uh, I want to give this example here of uh, Victor Busso. So if, if you don't know the example here, he was just testing out a new setup and he pointed it, I, as I understand, somewhere near Zenith and just allow, yeah, whatever uh, closest galaxy was, was close overhead and just allowed the, 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 the camera to expose. And it just so happened <laughs> he caught an emerging supernova. Right, and this was the actual shock breakout that I talked about. So these are the points uh, uh, provided by Victor Busso. And it wasn't an, until afterwards that uh, um, professional observatories were able to follow up, right? So there's Victor uh, standing in front of his telescope. Okay, how to coordinate, okay? Uh, I know that uh, grandma, has uh, done one of these webinars that provided uh, information about their research. And I'm not gonna go into details, but they are having great success with developing the infrastructure 
to coordinate amongst observers, right? So that's one thing. So not a free for all, but organization between people that are contributing, right? And grandma is playing a leading role in that. Now, parallel to that effort, there is a working group between SNOOS and AVSO that's developing kind of priorities for AVSO members that may not be a part of the grandma network, things that they can do, right? Actually, we've already started thinking about these uh, likely progenitor stars of supernovae to do regular, vi even visual observations, or at least do the monitoring of these pre-supernova uh, um, stars. So if, well, when they do explode at some point, there'll be a historical record of what's happening. And I'll highlight uh, work of George Heinz Baron and uh, Sebastian and many others that have been helping with this. Um, the goal is to have a community alliance with agreed upon uh, goals and shared data practices. So it can be shared between individual groups and facilities. I bring this point up because in uh, the professional community, there's a lot of this competition for who's gonna get there. And I guess it's just a natural thing with time domain astronomy where who's gonna get, it's, it's the science of getting there first, right? But given the, how valuable this is and rare, this is one of these times when everybody needs to be in it together to get the most uh, science possible. And I always use, uh, you have to remember you're recruiting from the human race. Well, I'm hoping that we can all be friendly okay, and develop a master plan on the best strategy. Okay. Um, I think I have at least a, a couple minutes. I want to talk about what do we do in the meantime? Okay, so the last kind of galactic supernova was this 1987A. And what do we do sitting around? Because it's, you know, years of, of operation for snooze and there hasn't been a supernova. One of the best ways to be able to do this is practice. And I'm endorsing that you practice on extra galactic supernovae because people think mistakenly that the next galactic supernova is going to be honkingly bright. Actually, it's likely to be pretty faint. It's likely to be on the other side of the galaxy okay, with a lot of dust extinction. So one way you can get used to uh, zeroing in on a transient is to do extra galactic supernovae, which you have lots to choose from. So there are professional uh, surveys that discover, you know, 10,000 plus supernovae per year, or there's a rich amateur community. And I've worked a lot with Stu Parker over the year, who by uh, day is a dairy farmer in New Zealand, but by night is a, a very prolific supernova discoverer. So supernovae occur approximately one per galaxy per century. So, you know, if we're gonna wait our own galaxy, we might have to wait a hundred years. <laughs> That's not fun. But if you monitor a hundred, or in this case, you know, millions of galaxy, you can find many more. And I wanna show you how fun it is to discover one of these, or at least to follow up. So here is uh, data provided by, by Stu. Here's the before image, and here's the after. And I think people here can appreciate how fun it is to look back at a galaxy and see something change, right? And think about this, okay? This was a single star. Then all of a sudden this star has a brightness that rivals the entire galaxy, right? The star can be billion, brighter than billions of stars put together. That's huge. Uh, I wanna share something that I've been working on for a couple of years. It's still in beta testing, but I'm, I'm really looking for uh, contributors before we go kind of live in public. Uh, I'm, I'm developing this crowdsourcing uh, website where if you're wondering which transient is the, is the best one for me to observe at any given time, because there are tons to, uh, if any of you are, are familiar with, with David Bishop's Bright Supernova webpage, you go there now, he lists thousands of supernovae that you could potentially be observing. How do you know which one to do at any given point and which one is the most science rich and which one can you potentially provide science for? Well, this refit, Recommender Engine for Intelligent Transient Tracking, provides all this know-how. So 
it ingests all this information from the uh, all sky surveys it makes predictions about how the transient will evolve so it can provide you a predicted magnitude and then it can you can sign up for alerts that it will provide to you uh, for which you can then um, take an observation of the field and report it back and refit can make then a better prediction about how it's going to evolve here's a screenshot of what it looks like uh, because the names are so crazy these days, ZTF 21 AA BCQU, we like to use this random name generator, Gracious Distracted Hoover, for instance. These, these will be different for each target. Ah, and to show that I got some skin in the game, I finally went out and bought my own telescope. And let me just tell you, I've been so impressed with how far technology has improved just in the last five years. Okay, so I want to show you here in the, my last couple minutes remaining here. Uh, Astro Boiler Telescope, that's the one I showed you. LCOGT, this is 0.4 meter telescope operated by, yeah, um, the Las Cumbres Observatory Global Telescope. This is, they're located in Hawaii, you know, in Bortle 2. I'm located in downtown Lafayette, Bortle 8, with my 28 centimeter telescope versus their 40. Look at the image quality that I'm able to get. My image versus theirs. This I triggered, okay? I showed this to, 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 to somebody and they said, look, it looks like flying potatoes coming from the professional observatory from a dark site in a high mountaintop observatory. This is, I did it from my backyard. I, can't, I have a limiting magnitude of around 19. This is unfiltered. Not quite fair to make that, but I'm comparing this, this telescope versus the other. Now, maybe it was, okay, let me zoom in here. My image versus theirs. Now, you could say, oh, but it's not fair to make the comparison. It looks like they lost tracking. Well, this is what they provided with me four days later after I originally submitted for an observation, right? You see, just me doing observation, I can contribute something that the professional observatory wasn't able to do. All of a sudden, I can contribute a valuable uh, point to the emerging light curve. Oh, by the way, I thought, okay, it's not fair. Let me try another observation with L LCO. This is what they spit back to me. It looks like there was cloud cover, right? And then I stayed up late last night. So I said, okay, maybe it was really rare. I got the best night in Lafayette in a century. So I stayed up late. It was really hot and humid. This is a raw unprocessed image, a single 300 second exposure with the ABT. And let me just tell you, I do not have optimal observing conditions. I cannot polar align my equatorial telescope because I got trees in the way. <laughs> so I did the best I could with a, with, with, with a compass and I got off axis guiding, which was really the, the, the clincher. And I had just enough sky to be able to find the target thanks to refit of what to observe. And this is not dark conditions. I told you, I showed you the map, the light pollution map. Uh, let me also show you another source of light pollution, a museum's flood lamp that they installed a few months ago. This goes on all night, right? It looks, I, I sometimes confuse this for a galactic supernova. I'm looking through this in my bedroom windows right before I close the blinds. <laughs> so I'm observing, this is also contributing to my background. Okay. So from my backyard, with a simple 11 inch telescope. I'm able to get this that's rivaling uh, telescope 0.4 meter in Hawaii. Okay. And you know, the, the C, now I always like to say it's not the telescope, it's the operator, right? Uh, in this case, I have to give some credit to the CMOS detector, ZWO. Wow, amazing stuff. Okay, uh, I'll leave it at that. So I just wanted to, to use this opportunity to advertise, let you know about the supernova early warning system that we're our goal, our mission is to alert the, the world of the next galactic supernova. We need people to act on this information promptly and efficiently. I, I uh, underscored how observing the star before shock breakout is of a high priority. I am really, a uh, strong believer that the AVSO uh, will play a unique and critical role in this follow-up. 
and dramatic improvements in technology make contributions from amateurs. They're not amateurs. They just, people have other day jobs, okay? Uh, the on par are even superior than uh, professional observatories. What wins out is uh, geographic diversity because of uh, conditions, sky conditions, right? And strength in numbers, just who's around at any given point, okay? So I encourage you to think about joining the snooze team. Here's the website. The website is getting a facelift, but you'll find a link there for joining the mailing list. And if you're interested in joining the refit team, uh, we're in beta testing right now, but I can uh, get you connected. And then hopefully uh, I can talk again about refit as a service uh, uh, when it's fully opened up in the future. Okay, and uh, right now, then I'll, I'll 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 say that that's the end, and I'd like very much to open up uh, to, to questions. Uh, to remind you, also with me is Dr. Barry Poynton and Dr. Alec Habig, uh, who are um, part of the, the snooze team and can answer uh, questions you may have. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Milosevic. That was excellent. So we have a couple questions that have come in already. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with Sean Hartley's question. This was from back near the very beginning of the presentation when you showed a um, slide where there it was showing um, the different shells of elements that have been formed by fusion in a star's life cycle. Uh, Sean had asked, why does the element formation sequence skip elements in the periodic table? Oh, that is a function of the nuclear pathways and the there are certain elements that are conducive to being built up as the fusion takes place. Okay. All right, uh, thanks. And then we had a question from Jay Miller who had asked um, from how far away can neutrinos be detected? Oh, I'll pass that to Alec. Yeah, so the, the neutrinos from supernova we're talking about would be the Milky Way and the Magellanic Clouds, pretty much. Uh, even, even Andromeda, which is you know, the next closest big galaxy, of course, uh, since the neutrinos from the supernova are spreading out uh, 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 as one over R squared, uh, and they're so hard to detect by the time they, you take one over distance to uh, uh, M31 squared, our, our detectors on Earth won't be able to see more than one or two neutrinos, and so we wouldn't wouldn't necessarily notice them. So it really is kind of a kind of a local thing to just our galaxy. Uh, neutrinos in general, uh, some of the big experiments looking for very high energy neutrinos, like like Ice Cube at the South Pole, are seeing neutrinos coming from uh, uh, active galactic nuclei, the, the supermassive black holes uh, in galaxies far away that are shooting out giant jets of particles and uh, for the very energetic neutrinos you get from that, you could see them across the universe. But for, for supernova, which are much much lower energy uh, uh, neutrinos, and you need a bunch of them to see them, uh, you, it, it has to happen in our galaxy somewhere, which is unfortunate. But on the other hand, that means that when we do see them, it's going to be great because we'll, we'll have a catbird seat. There you go. Thank you. Wow, um, active galactic nuclei neutrinos. That's amazing. <laughs> All right, uh, our next question is coming from Isabel Akmontvik Poynton, who has uh, asked, what do you mean when you say that we have no credible records of the Cassiopeia A supernova? I'm wondering how much research has been done by historians in order to find references to it? Tons, tons of research. Um, maybe I didn't find the best word. No credible just means uh, when held up to scrutiny. So uh, Flamsteed reportedly observed the, the supernova behind the Cassiopeia A remnant that we see today. So a lot of people had associated Flamsteed uh, with the reporting, but um, many people have gone to the original records of Flamsteed and try to you know, do the math and it would, would it be possible and it hasn't really held up. Now, more recently in the literature, I, I understand that there was thoughts that Cassini may have observed uh, the supernova associated with Cassiopeia A. But uh, that hasn't been, uh, it's still in question, let's say, and we're waiting on that uh, definitive evidence, right? It's not as clear as it has been for the other examples that I gave. 
Thank you. That's a good answer. All right. Let me look at the questions which have just come in. Um, all right. So one from Timothy Weather, who, who asked, um, what percentage of the star's mass is uh, astronomers' metals, so anything heavier than helium, uh, that isn't swallowed up in a stellar collapse and is instead thrown out and distributed uh, due to the supernova explosion? So how much of the astronomers metals makes it out of the supernova and doesn't get trapped in the remnant or the, you know, the neutron star, <laughs> sorry. Um, that's an interesting, I've never done a percentage uh, quantification before. Um, let's see, so we have the, the, the core region of the, the, the star that uh, collapses down. Uh, much of the rest of the star is unaware of the core collapse and the shock wave pushes through it. So those hydrogen helium layers up above, they get pushed out, the, the vast majority. Uh, the caveat to that is if there's been some stripping of the star, that a lot of that hydrogen layer may have been uh, removed, and then there can be mixing where some of that hydrogen envelope uh, gets mixed inward. And we think actually that may have happened in part with the uh, 1987A explosion as well. Thank you. One uh, kind of fun uh, coda to that, if I could. Go ahead. But, uh, a lot of these light curves for supernovas you see have, have uh, uh, yeah, they, they go bright as you, know, you expect from explosion and they dim off as you expect from explosion. And then they kind of tail off in a, and level off. And a lot of that uh, uh, source of the energy to keep it bright for longer comes from the radioactive decay of, uh, of nickel, which is a lot of the iron in the core that got zorched in the explosion. Some of it ended up as nickel. And the half-life of that decay curve and brightness matches the half-life of the, the gamma emissions of, uh, I think it's nickel 56. And so there's enough of the stuff to make to make the thing stay bright for a long time. I don't know if that is in percentage times, but it's kind of a kind of a pretty cool effect. Great addition there. That leads um, directly into our next question, which was, can you shed some light on how the elements higher than iron are formed? So more massive. Oh, well, uh, you know, I wish I had this slide uh, ready. So uh, I, I, as I alluded to, uh, a lot of those will be formed in the core collapse explosion. Okay? Um, there's this burning wave. So in fact, all this, yeah, all this time of, of making this high uh, 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 iron in the core Okay, that gets disrupted as things can, uh, you know, get uh, broken down into simpler elements to the, the, the uh, fundamental neutrons. But then this burning wave goes through uh, the interior of the star and makes heavier elements and fuses them. Okay. Um, now the proportions depends on the type of explosion. So uh, a lot of the elements critical to life, oxygen, uh, calcium that I mentioned, those are produced in the core collapse explosions. Then there's the type 1a explosions, which produce more iron, okay, and other iron peak elements. Uh, then you got kilonovae, which have been talked about a lot more recently. And then, so there's various R process elements. There's certain elements that they produce in, in greater quantity. I know gold gets talked about a lot, but there's certain elements, again, going back to those nuclear pathways where that type of explosion is more, um, will we'll preferentially make a, 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 a type of a, a elemental distribution. Thank you. One of, the, one of the best scientific animations I've ever seen was, if you know the, the chart of the nucleides, which has a plot of all the different isotopes, you know, of, uh, you know how many protons and neutrons does everything have. S uh, someone who studies this in detail as a supernova explodes and is throwing particles all over the place with lots of energy to, to, to smash them together and make all the new ones heavier than iron. You know, uh, they had an animation of a chart of the nucleides with all the different isotopes of everything growing as all the neutrons flying around smashing. It was fantastic. I need to find a copy of that. But uh, uh, people have studied it in great detail. And uh, you know, that's the only way you get you know, wedding rings here on Earth, right? Is that, is that some iron from some supernova kept smashing into other stuff all the way up the periodic table and a little bit of it landed out there for uh, uh, to get swept up in the next star that was born. And there's a lovely uh, 
periodic table you can find online by Jennifer Johnson that's got uh, what uh, the origin of the different elements are. And so it's very nice to just sort of take a look and uh, see the periodic table in, in terms of the, you know, the astrophysics behind it. Yeah, I'm trying to find the link right now, but of course, Google is uh, choking on me, maybe because of the video feed. But if you do a, a simple search, Chandra Element Production, I know the Chandra Observatory made uh, a great chart about this. Um, it shows the uh, the various, it shows the periodic table and the different explosion uh, behind it. All right, thank you. That's a good recommendation. Uh, perhaps one of us will be able to find it and put the link in the chat while some of the other questions are being answered. So uh, next up, let's talk a little bit about uh, observational questions. So first of all, we had an anonymous attendee ask, which specific ZWO camera are you using? And uh, do you use a focal reducer on your scope? Uh, the, uh, it, it took months to come in, yes, but the ZWO 6, uh, uh, ASI 6200 mm. ASI 6200 mm. Okay. And I do not use a focal reducer on my C11. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I know that the ASI 183 mm is what um, the AVSO is using on several of their remote scopes, and that one's also quite highly recommended. Um, let's see. So Miguel Carrion had asked what kind of filter would you recommend for improving supernova observations? So uh, that's actually uh, not a straightforward question to answer. Depends on the size of your scope. Um, at, with the refit project, we've been developing the transformations to go from unfiltered to the ZTF survey, which is uh, the Zwicky transient uh, uh, facility a survey that refit uh, piggybacks off of, um, yeah, to make that transformation using colors between unfiltered and R band. So if you have a smaller telescope and you want to go after the fainter objects, that's the way to go. Um, if you want to contribute, uh, you know, depend. If you want to stick with brighter objects, then you could use a, a kind of a, a standard Sloan uh, uh, filter set. Uh, we're kind of moving away from the old uh, Johnson uh, UBVRI, and more often it's 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 geared towards the 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 SDSS uh, GRI filter set. That's the one I'm waiting on. By the way, I mean I waited eight months for these Astrodon filters to come through. They didn't, so I ended up uh, uh, ordering from Chroma filters instead. Thank you. That's a good tip. I know we've had a lot of our observers mention the difficulty of obtaining filters lately. All right, uh, next question comes from Bob Tracy, who's asked a uh, broad one. How will the AAVSO participate in SNOOS? So if you can maybe focus on how an individual observer could participate. Okay, you know, I'm gonna pass this to, to, to Barry, but I'll just say broadly, <laughs> the question is nuanced. So um, I, there's no way I can summarize everything here, but as I described in the talk, there will be a dual strategy organized between targeting these uh, nearby stars. And for that, you can use smaller aperture uh, telescopes, maybe in a high cadence, you can do a movie mode or something really depending on how, how nearby. Um, as opposed, and then leveraging grandma infrastructure that can pan a wide field to observe, you know, if it's not one of these nearby stars, it could be something that we don't know about. And grandma provides observation, sorry, the, the uh, information needed to coordinate multiple observers simultaneously to uh, tile a, a sky region. Uh, Barry, I don't know if you wanna contribute a little bit more about what they should, what, what they need to know on how to participate. Yeah, it's a, it's a very exciting opportunity. I mean, the two parts you mentioned uh, when the big day arrives and the big event comes, we want to make sure that we are able to get as much uh, observation before the, the light occurs. So we need first responders when the, the snooze alert goes out and 
have uh, a program to know where they can look and how to look and so on. And so the AAVSO, I'm always impressed with the organizational skills. If we could work together to have uh, the setup uh, using Grandma and other systems to have a set of dedicated first responders. So in, in light of that, we're hoping in the near future to have what we call a fire drill, where we have an organized uh, time when we uh, simulate a snooze alert and uh, we can try out the systems then. And it can be anything from uh, there's a snooze alert, go out and observe something to uh, an earlier uh, fire drill where uh, there was observations in a specific region of the sky. So we'd love to have a VSO members get involved as first responders. We need to come up with manuals and ways of describing the best way to do the observations. Another program which has been amazing, we've had a lot of good response from a VSO members about curating a candidate list and already uh, looking at observations that are presently being done uh, of the candidate list to prepare for the big day. So if we can have so. The curated lists have been worked on by a VSO members and others. And so having a, a, a program waiting for your favorite stars to explode. So if we can get that from a scientific viewpoint, get those observations and one of those stars does explode, then we'll have a, a treasure trove of scientific information. And we should even have a lottery where you pick your favorite star and which is gonna be the next one to explode and see whether or not uh, see whether or not you win the great lottery. So there's a lot of a lot of good stuff going on. So please sign up. Uh, we have a Slack channel. We have all sorts of things going on. We'll be having another meeting with Snooze in the AAB so very soon, and uh, hopefully we'll get a fire drill going so that people can just get a feel for it. So you know, keep uh, so please subscribe to the, uh, the snooze alert and also keep your ear to the ground of what's happening. There's a lot of good stuff coming soon. Excellent, thank you. So I think that feeds into our next question, which was, can you say a, a few words on the alerts from snooze via GCN perhaps? Uh, like what is a GCN and how to get those machine readable alerts? Alec, I'll pass that right to you. Yeah, so uh, uh, right the right now when snooze uh, uh, were if there was a supernova in our galaxy and we were to get a neutrino instance and send things out, we would send out an you know an, an email to the list because in you know 2000 when we started it that was about the only way to get the word out. Uh, but we also uh, uh, send a machine readable alert to uh, GCN, which I think is Gamma Ray Coordination Network, uh, and that's many transients uh, uh, up, uh, appear there. Uh, and we right now, of course, since we don't have a supernova, we just send out a test, uh, a test alert that's once a week or once a month, I forget what it is, to make sure that the machinery works. So if you subscribe to the, the snooze uh, uh, alerts in GCN, right now you'll get just that test alert every month so that you know it works. Uh, but when one happens, you will also for real, you'll get a real one which says, you know, not, not, not a test. This is you know, not, not, uh, 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 not a test of something real. And hopefully we will then also be able to tag with follow-ups on that as, as, as Dan mentioned, uh, where, where generally to, to look. Now, a caveat, we're working hard uh, to make this better with Snooze 2.0 to do something similar to the way that uh, LIGO does with the, with the gravitational waves where a sky map comes out that gets better as we get more information uh, attached attached to that kind of alert to make it better for all my automated automated telescopes. Thank you. Um, okay, let's switch back to some more science focused questions. Uh, we had a question from Bob Buckheim who had asked uh, when you pointed out that map of the candidate progenitors and where they are relative to the sun. Um, how confident are you that that is a complete or nearly complete list? And roughly, what is the range of apparent magnitudes that we're looking at for these progenitors? I am completely confident that is an incomplete list. <laughs> I mean, uh, 
this is a, actually an active area of research right now uh, amongst some of the SNUs members. Uh, I, I recently spoke with, uh, sorry, email exchange with um, Phil Massey, who you may have had at some point, or at least you, 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 if you haven't heard of his name, he is, he's been around almost, a, oh, I shouldn't say that. He's been around a while. He knows massive stars and he's been reluctant to make this kind of um, uh, listing because of the, the, the great challenges with extinction and distances. Now, um, Gaia helps a lot, but you know, once you go beyond a couple kiloparsecs, it, it, you, you, you have that challenge again. So um, with the, some of the AVSO members, Sebastian included, we've been going through the original, well, whatever's been in the literature, updating with Gaia distances to kind of uh, make firmer constraints. But then uh, there's the other, you know, there's two strategies. You can try to make as pure a list as possible, which is small, or as broad as list as possible that has contamination that you're willing to mm -hmm. undergo, right? And we're in this process right now of how expansive of the, the list do we want? You know, what's the threshold for contamination that we're willing to, to accept? Thank you. All right, so our next question is coming from Joyce Guzik, who has asked, um, how do these close binary systems of neutron stars or black holes form if both of them had previously gone supernovae, supernova with the potential to eject lots of matter asymmetrically and disrupt the binary system? Yeah, great question. I cannot contribute anything meaningful uh, to that answer. That's an area investigation for stellar evolution. Uh, people. I mean, the first LIGO system that had such massive black holes to begin with, that already challenged what we thought massive star systems would be able to produce. So these LIGO discoveries are really pushing the envelope for the simulations to be able to understand uh, how, how they're made. But uh, that said, I don't want to, you know, disregard it. I, I, I'd actively uh, encourage that person to, to seek somebody out, or if they're interested, email me and I can put them in contact with somebody who thinks about this more deeply than I do. Thank you. That's a great offer there. So um, Isabel Ak akamofiv Poynton, sorry for mispronouncing your name, pretty sure I did, <laughs> um, had asked, uh, why do we think that neutrinos might be a factor in driving the core explosion if they rarely interact with matter otherwise? So uh, great question. We've kind of been pushed into this scenario because there's a limited number of things that can contribute towards the core collapse explosion. And as our understanding of neutrino physics and neutrino transport and how they can interact um, with, with, with matter is improved, it seems like a more likely solution. Uh, there's also been increasingly sophisticated simulations moving from not just 1D, and that was part of the issue, by the way, that I didn't um, emphasize, is the move from 1D to 2D. So adding some degree of asymmetry, possible asymmetry, seems to be a key of allowing the explosion to take place. So the thought is that the, un, the neutrinos that are being produced may heat unevenly that produces an asymmetry that allows the explosion to proceed. The original models were all 1D and no, basically none of them were able to, to, to explode. So, I mean, that is also why the next galactic supernova will be so informational rich because we'll have measurements of the neutrino output hopefully gravitational waves and all the EM information to really um, narrow down, constrain how those neutrinos are contributing to the overall explosion process. It's also a matter, a uh, simple, a numbers game. Uh, two things are happening. That proto-neutron star is some of the densest stuff in the universe. So if you're gonna have something that gets affected by, by something as tenuous as neutrinos, it's going to be a neutron star, right? It's just so darn dense. Uh, and the number of neutrinos that are being spewed out is so huge. And so even if you know, any one neutrino might have a, a mean free path of a light year or lead or whatever the, whatever the canonical thing is, there are just so many of them 
that it dumps an appreciable amount of energy into the bottom of that really, really thick uh, 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 neutron star. The numbers are just so, have so many zeros after them that it ends up working out even though the neutrinos interact with star weakly. Yep, yep. And our understanding from supernova 1987A sort of bears out those numbers. And so that, that one data point tells us that we're on the right track. And more recently, we've also measured the probabilities of you know, what is the likelihood of a neutrino hitting a, a certain type of, of nucleus. And we have those numbers now more than ever. And so if putting all those numbers together, we know that neutrinos have to play a big part in it. Thank you, that's all good points. So um, Dr. Milosevic, Milosevic, sorry, um, had had a uh, mentioned asymmetry, and our next question is also talking about asymmetry. Uh, specifically, it had asked, um, when I see pictures of supernova remnants, they don't seem to be symmetrical in shape. Is this deformity due to nearby stars, or is it because of something else? Ah, well, that's part of what I love investigating, and I'll take the moment. We should be wrapping up, I know, but I just, I mean, this is, this is what I spend a lot of my time doing is mapping in three dimensions what the explosion looks like, right? And at some point it was thought that, you know, this is the, the structure is influenced by the surrounding material or as the question asked, some like a nearby star. But no, this is uh, geometry, this is morphology that's been frozen in around the time of core collapse. Just so you, you see that large ring, right? Mm -hmm. There's actually multiple rings that make up this remnant. Uh, those are cross sections of interior bubbles mapped out on the inside. Uh, here it is being filled in a bit. This is all uh, reflecting uh, the explosion dynamics. And I could show you simulations of, of mixing of the nickel rich material. Remember, Alec mentioned uh, radioactive nickel 56. Well, that decays on pretty short time scales to cobalt 56, which also contributes to that tail of the, the light curve that he was, was mentioning, which then decays to iron. And all this tells us something about how the explosion proceeded. So the morphology of the, rem depending on the age, modulo the age, so class A being 300 and 40 years or so, you know, it's young enough that the influence of the surrounding material is negligible, but something old like the Cygnus loop, it's been interacting for a long time and that retains le far less uh, um, information about the uh, original arrangement of the material at the time of explosion. And the neutron stars themselves show evidence of this because they are often headed off at great speed in random directions, uh, not consistent with the orbits of regular stars. And it's, and it's suspected that an asymmetric explosion was sent at shooting off into space like a giant cosmic squid uh, at about the, uh, the, the observed uh, velocities we see. Thank you. It's very cool. All right, we're getting down to uh, just the last couple of questions here. So we had an anonymous question. How long does a supernova stay bright enough to be detected by a telescope? Oh, that's a great question. So that's a strong factor, obviously, of uh, how nearby it is. So there are some supernovae uh, that will only be able to, to follow for, um, again, measure of the distance. I mean, some of these fast blue opticals, they're gone in a couple days, right? Whereas other superluminous supernovae, they have time scales of many months, right? But they tend to be more distant. So the way we can, the, the time that we can observe them may only be, um, you know, weeks to a month to two months, et cetera. Whereas nearby events, um, we may be able to watch, you know, a hundred years later all depends on the type of explosion um, and how nearby it is. Thank you. All right, um, that looks like that's it from attendees. However, I had a couple questions of my own I would, I'd like to ask. Um, one was about the uh, kind of direct black hole collapse uh, NOVA you mentioned. Um, what would be the observational signature of one of those? Like Unclear. 
unclear? No, no. <laughs> okay. That's why it's so important. You know, uh, the neutrino signature, in a sense, will be the only no way to know for sure. So okay. there are observations of these winking out systems, mm -hmm. right? But we don't know for sure whether there was a collapse down to a black hole. There's the question of, you know, like Ada Carr. It had, you know, the, um, the, a brightening, and then it went from being one of the brightest stars to, you know, something very dim because all this dust formed around. It. So that could be what these winking out stars are doing, although there are follow up observations that uh, prove against that. But um, let's just say that there's a parameter space of models which can both be where it, 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 it winks out in um, a, a very weak explosion. Uh, but there are also uh, parameters where there may be still a luminous explosion and a collapse down to uh, a black hole. So this was proposed actually in supernova uh, 1979C that it was very luminous uh, at 12 megaparsecs, but uh, it may have formed a black hole. So it may have been one of these uh, unusual events. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, looks like we had another question from the audience come in while you're answering that. Uh, it says it was a follow up to the first question. How does supernova ejecta condense back into new stars and planets if it's being scattered in all directions? <laughs> okay, I do not have a great explanation for that because that's actually something I've been interested in, but nobody writes in detail. So I tell this uh, story about uh, uh, core collapse explosion, well, supernovae providing raw materials for uh, the next generations of stars, but it's a, you know, it's, it's a process. So it, it spreads it out, it seeds, it distributes. Um, and then from that ejecta can evolve new systems. I mean, it's, uh, there are people that run these simulations of uh, explosions and developments of new stars. Um, I don't have uh, anything intelligent to say. I don't know if Alec or, or Barry know a little bit more, but it's uh, kind of the, the cartoon uh, notion that I, that I provide. A, a little bit. One of, the, uh, one of the ways that star forming is, is likely triggered is the you know, giant molecular cloud is, is happily stable out there uh, in some sort of a cold equilibrium. What makes it start to collapse to, to form new stars? And, uh, one candidate for that is these supernova explosions. When they explode, and you know you have the uh, uh, you know Cas A turning into the Velo loop and and, and 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 dispersing over tens of thousands of years, that shock wave heads off through space. And since the stars which explode live fast and die young, they're often in the neighborhood, think Orion, uh, of star forming regions themselves. And that shock wave plows into the molecular cloud next door, and it gives it the kick it needs to start collapsing. Now, how, how, how do you get the, the, the elements mixed in there is, 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 is I agree. I, don't, I haven't seen a good explanation of that, but the uh, uh, you know, sort of chain, chain reaction supernova over, over millions of years uh, seems, to be, seems to be a pretty good idea. Thank you very much. That makes a lot of sense. All right. So, um... Dr. Milosav Levick, uh, you had mentioned at one point during the talk that uh, you said you weren't sure if Betelgeuse would ever explode. Was that a metaborical statement or uh, for? Within my lifetime, elaborate? it definitely will explode, but whether I'm not, I'm around to observe, uh, you know, to witness that event, uh, that I'm not willing to stake my career on, but it, it definitely <laughs> yes. will explode. Okay, just checking. <laughs> And it All would right. be so cool that that's one of the examples that everybody with a neutrino experiment uses. What will my detector look like if, if Betelgeuse goes? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. And, yeah. and will my detector be able to handle it or will there be so much light that it'll fall over? So. <laughs> mm -hmm. There you years. go. Okay. And um, it looks like that's it for the question. So I want to go ahead and wrap up this Q&A just by saying, I know you've mentioned this earlier, but you're, um, you're, refit program looks really awesome. So could you go ahead and say for everyone who's still with us, um, how do we get involved with that? Can you remind us so that hopefully some observers will get involved with that? Great. So uh, I'll say briefly, I don't like to pitch a half-baked idea. So 
That's why I'm not opening up to everybody yet. But if you're motivated and you're willing to deal with the kind of kludgy website in process and you want to get in at the ground level of helping develop this uh, website, I'd love to hear from you. And even others who just maybe in the future want to learn more about it, you can contact me uh, directly. You can, you can find my name uh, pretty easily. Um, I don't know if you can post it somewhere, Lauren mm -hmm. or, or something. Absolutely. But yeah dmillisav at purdue.edu. Um, so that's the, the refit project. And it, I can, I'll be able to provide details about kind of minimum requirements uh, that you need to be able to do it at this stage. But you know, our, our, our resources are gonna be flexible enough uh, so that you could be even going after fairly bright targets and fairly bright being uh, beginning at around, well, it's all relative of course, but around uh, 14 meg, um, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the refit project, we're trying to make, we're trying to crowdsource Earth to monitor the universe. And I think it's a great opportunity to practice uh, uh, observing transient phenomena. Mm -hmm. And uh, by con uh, contributing to the, the, the project, you'll get automatically uh, con uh, added to the author list for the scientific papers that come out of this research. Wow, all right. Well, um, I just put your email address in the chat so that if anyone is interested in helping out with that project, then they can contact you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, put up our end card here because it looks like that's it for questions. One second. There we go. <laughs> okay, so to close the webinar, I would like to first start by extending a huge thank you to Dr. Milosav Levick, Dr. Habig, and Dr. Poynton for sharing your time and knowledge with us today. I would also like to thank again our sponsors, DC3 Dreams and Boyce Astro. DC3 Dreams provides high-end observatory automation and web-based multi-user remote imaging. The AAVSO Net Observatories use DC3 Dreams ACP Expert for the Bright Star Monitors and other programs. The AAVSO Photometric All Sky Survey Project, also known as APAS, has used ACP Expert's AI scheduler to automatically acquire over 500,000 star fields, hands off, at a rate of 1,000 square degrees per night. This has resulted in photometry for over 128 million objects in about 99% of the sky. The Boyce Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the Journal of the AVSO. 